Hello and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Grant Newsham is a senior fellow with the Center for Security Policy. He's also a research fellow at the Japan Forum for Strategic Studies, focusing on Asia Pacific defense, political and economic matters. He is a retired US Marine Colonel and was the first US Marine liaison officer to the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. He also served as reserve head of intelligence for Marine Forces Pacific and was the US Marine attache, US Embassy Tokyo on two occasions. Grant Newsham has more than 20 years of experience in Japan and elsewhere in Asia. So he's well able to offer the Asian perspective on the strategic challenges China presents to Japan and Taiwan and how the two of them may face that threat. Uh, Grant, welcome to the program. Okay, well, thanks very much, Bob. I appreciate the, the opportunity to, to weigh in. Please uh, tell us how you think Japan and Taiwan are regarding the strategic challenge or threat from China mm -hmm. as it stands now. Sure, the, uh, I'll start with the Japanese um, and they're scared to death. Uh, they being Japanese, they don't exactly display that terror, uh, but they are really worried. Uh, and part of the reason is that they, they know that Taiwan's defense is Japan's defense. In fact, that's an expression that you used to hear over, I've heard it over the last 15 years uh, from what I would call Japanese military officers who think about these things. And it's almost a cliche. And there's a reason for that. And you look at the map and that'll explain everything. And you see Taiwan that sits down sort of mm -hmm. below the Japan's Southern islands. And it's effectively serves a blocking uh, function. Uh, and if Taiwan becomes under Chinese control at that point, if you look at it from Japan's perspective, uh, they have got a real problem because the, the Chinese People's Liberation Army will be in a position where it can uh, easily move into the, the Pacific. It's, there's nothing blocking it anymore. Uh, it's effectively breached that first so-called first island chain, which is a chain that violence that stretches from Japan down to Taiwan, to the Philippines, uh, and then down to Indonesia, and even over to the Straits of Malacca, depending on how you calculate it. And that effectively hems in the, the Chinese uh, military, but take Taiwan and the, the walls have been breached. And if you, once you have the Chinese military, the Navy, the Air Force operating uh, with great freedom to the east, uh, they will be operating up to the east of Japan. And at that point, they have outflanked Japan's southern defenses. Japan is uh, sort of fortifying its southern islands right now. Uh, so if it's facing off to the west, uh, but if Taiwan goes, the Chinese have gone around those defenses, they've outflanked them. Additionally, you'll see the Chinese Navy and Air Force operating up east of Japan uh, regularly, and in effect, surrounding Japan. And that hasn't happened since 1945. So that's a real problem for the Japanese. And then there's another <clears throat> basic problem that they face. And that is with Taiwan under Chinese control, China is then able to cut the sea lanes through the South China Sea and also through the East China Sea. And that is where most of Japan's oil shipments come from. A huge proportion of its trade runs through the South China Sea. So China, Japan looks at it and they say, they see Taiwan uh, as incredibly important from their own national defense perspective, from a geographic perspective. And they are afraid of having their sea lanes cut off, afraid of being surrounded by a more aggressive, uh, more present uh, um, Chinese military. Uh, so that's plenty of reason for the, the Japanese to be frightened. And the J Japanese, of course, they, um, have 2,000 years of experience with the Chinese, and a lot of it hasn't been particularly pleasant. Uh, some of it has, but not, not in recent times, and even much of the older times wasn't either. So there's a sort of a visceral 
fear of, of China uh, within the, the Japanese public. Now, what, what you've seen, however, in recent times is the, I mean, very recent times, you're now seeing Japanese officials uh, say more openly that Taiwan matters. Taiwan is, a, is, is, a, is important to Japan. And they imply that Japan will get involved in defending Taiwan or helping the Americans in the event the Americans help Taiwan, et cetera. And this is something you wouldn't have heard just three, five years ago. Uh, but now it's being said publicly by more Japanese officials than ever. Uh, has this translated into Japan uh, taking the concrete steps that it needs to do to be able to help Taiwan or respond to a, uh, a scenario involving Taiwan? I haven't seen that yet. So far, it's, it's a lot of talk. It's good talk. Uh, but the actual concrete manifestations of improved Japanese capability or activities that would allow them to uh, provide some support for Taiwan, I haven't seen that happening yet. Uh, it does need to happen. So that's, Can, just, that's just the Japanese perspective. Of it. So there. Could, could you address for a moment exactly what are the Japanese capabilities? I mean, you, you must know the the Japan Self-Defense Force rather well. Mm -hmm. So what, what are they capable of today? And perhaps you could also comment on what their naval capabilities are, because they're facing not only the, the tremendous threat uh, should uh, China take over Taiwan, but uh, China is threatening the Senkaku Islands, which they also claim is their sovereign territory and which has been Japanese since the late 19th century. Well, that's right. The, what, what, the, what the Japanese are capable of um, is a lot more than they currently are doing. Uh, the Japanese Navy is the exception. And they have a very good niche capability, both for surface warfare, but particularly underwater warfare, submarines, anti-submarine warfare. But they currently serve as more as an augment, augmenting force to help the Americans. And the Americans don't have enough resources in Asia. Uh, the Chinese buildup has taken place uh, really with uh, too many people averting their eyes and not wanting to see it to the point where China is a considerable threat even to the US forces. The Americans need help. The China Japanese can provide some of this, particularly with their naval uh, capabilities. Uh, the rest of the Japanese military, it's got some work to do. Uh, the personnel are highly capable or they're very professional, uh, but it's a military which has never developed the way it should. Uh, it's been underfunded for decades. It probably needs to double its defense budget uh, tomorrow if it could be done. So it, it's never paid enough um, money for defense, no matter what they say. Uh, but also it, uh, cannot do some basic things that the military needs to do. And I would cite joint operations, which is where you combine air, sea, and ground capabilities uh, that you know, we take as a given for a, a modern military to be able to do. Unfortunately, the Japanese self-defense forces don't really have much capability in that regard. So while Japan does have on paper a formidable uh, force, in actual practice, it needs to improve itself quickly. And it isn't really their fault, the military's fault, but rather it's the, the political class, the Japan's uh, elite classes, the academia, the media, uh, the politicians, even officialdom have always belittled the military. They've downplayed it. They've humi done their best to humiliate it, in fact. Uh, and so it's developed in a way that's stunted and not uh, really uh, coordinated or combined the, the way it needs to be. Uh, one figure I would cite is that the Japanese military misses recruitment targets by about 20% every year. And that tells you something, uh, that it is not getting the attention in Northern respect it deserves. And if you go back to uh, US, the, the US situation, I would say this would have been about the 1970s uh, before Ronald Reagan took over. If you remember how the US military was uh, back then. Uh, you know, you joined the military, it was considered it would be a, a life of poverty. 
uh, or deprivation. And it really wasn't anything that a lot of people wanted to join. And it took Mr. Reagan to sort of pay for it all, but he also talked it up. In Japan, you haven't had either of those take place yet. And that needs to be done. It also needs to be given marching orders to get ready to fight a war and not to sort of prepare for the snow festival up in Hokkaido. Uh, and that's a, a very different, different thing than what it's used to. So th there's a lot to be done, but if say with some effort, some, some focused effort with the Americans helping uh, and the, the Japanese doing what they need to do, it, the JSDF, the Japan Self-Defense Force could be a very useful adjunct to the to US forces say particularly from the naval end, but also their air capabilities are pretty good if they could learn how to use them. Uh, and also the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force can play a very useful role in uh, operating anti-ship missiles, for example, anti-aircraft and even anti-submarine uh, weapons from this, these, this island chain from, their, uh, from Japanese territory. And that would make for a very long afternoon for Chinese forces trying to get through uh, the the Japanese held islands, or even to operate off of a good bit of Taiwan. Uh, so the, the Japanese have a big contribution to make, but unfortunately it, they've not been put in a position uh, where they felt they've needed to do it yet. And it's really waking up late and you always say, well, how could this possibly be and after 60 years of a, the US-Japan Defense Alliance? And that's a good question. How could it possibly be? Uh, that the, J the JSDF is really not where it needs to be in terms of war fighting capability, nor in its ability to operate with the U.S. forces. And that is a, it's an embarrassing question. The answer is embarrassing, or uh, should be, uh, that after all these years, that only the two navies can really operate together. I know one just example I will throw out of how uh, tardy we are is that uh, there is no joint headquarters quarters in Japan or anywhere else where U.S. and Japanese forces sit together and plan or care and carry out the, the defense of Japan, uh, doing things like planning for training, exercises, patrolling, uh, and there's no such headquarters. So the, the plan seems to be that if something happens, everybody will wing it, and that's not really the way to do it. You know, what should they be doing? Uh, like tomorrow, they should have a joint headquarters down on Okinawa to make the defense of Japan's southern islands, including the Senkakus, a joint Japan-US operation. And that needs to be done immediately. Will it? I doubt it, but it should be. So in some, the solutions are not that hard uh, when you think about them, but it just takes some, some effort. And the Americans have always been uh, unwilling to tell the Japanese what they need or what they want. There's an idea that well, we don't want to be the overbearing Americans who are you know, making people unhappy. Uh, there's any number of American officials who can tell you why whatever you want the Japanese to do is too hard. Uh, they'll actually make the excuses up for the Japanese themselves. Uh, and this, this is a situation which has to change and I don't think people understand just how dire it is. Uh, from our perspective, when you consider the Chinese threat. And this is, you know, you, but if you listen to many of the alliance managers, you, all you hear is, well, the, the alliance has never been stronger, the most important relationship, bar none, et cetera, et cetera. Well, where's that radio with which the, uh, the Japanese air, sea, and ground forces can talk to each other? Well, it doesn't exist. And that is hard to imagine. Where's that joint headquarters? You know, we hear about an alliance coordination mechanism. Um, I had always hoped, that, which supposedly exists, and everyone talks about it and what a wonderful thing it is. Uh, but I've always wished Mr. Trump had gone to Japan and asked the Japanese to take him to see the alliance coordination mechanism, because it does conjure up an image of big screens and Americans and Japanese together, and they're tracking aircraft and they're sending patrols out. Uh, but I think. Um, you would have heard a sort of a lot of teeth sucking uh, on that, uh, that it, well, there is no such place. And this is to my way of thinking, and there is no nice way to say it. This ought to be an embarrassment to the people on the US side who have run uh, Japan Matters uh, for all these years. And this is a, one of these things that if worse comes to worse, the price is going to be paid by young Lance corporals and sailors aplenty. 
Uh, so this is something that it, it's not an academic debate anymore. The Chinese have been very clear about what they intend to do, which is to one, take Taiwan, uh, but also to teach the, the Japanese a lesson. And also in part of that deal, it's to get the Americans uh, out of the region or else in a position from which they can't respond. Uh, so that's uh, just a few comments about it. And I think it surprises a lot of people you know, to hear just uh, uh, sort of how bad things are. Uh, it's um, in terms of Japanese capabilities, in terms of our ability to work with the Japanese, it uh, comes as a big surprise. Uh, it's something you're almost not allowed to say. Uh, and you can see why I never get invited many places. Uh, but uh, no, I'm sort of joking, but it's, uh, it's kind of an emperor has no clothes sort of, uh, sort of affair. But the, the, in terms of the, the basic capabilities of the Japanese military and the people who serve in it, it is, a, it is excellent, but it just needs to be taken advantage of uh, by both countries. Well, you know, before the uh, United States engaged in the large defense buildup in the 1980s, President Reagan had to talk to the American people about the nature of the threat with which it was represented from the Soviet Union and the strategic position in which we found ourselves, a, a very weakened condition after President Carter's uh, time in office. And politically, once the threat was perceived and taken seriously, he had bipartisan support in Congress for that buildup. Do you take these remarks by Japanese politicians, the defense minister, the prime minister, deputy prime minister, as something comparable in the J Japanese political world to prepare the people of Japan to take the threat uh, from China, particularly toward Taiwan, more seriously so that they then will support a more serious defense budget and take their military more seriously. Is that what you sense politically is going on? Um, yes, it's, these are significant comments. You know, it's, and they really have to be uh, valued and taken seriously. Uh, but one of the, the interesting parts of the Japanese dynamic is that the Japanese public has a much better sense of national defense and what is required than does the Japanese political class. Uh, when, and when things are explained to them, they say the, there's a Japanese expression called uh, atarimae, which means like, yeah, it's, um, or of course. And, and that's the expression you will get if someone says should defend Japan defend itself from China. Well, atarimae. And of course, but the Japanese government, the administrations almost never clearly present what's needed, what's required uh, to sell it to the public. And when they do, the public response is generally very supportive. Uh, I would cite Mr. Abe, who actually did try and did some good work. Uh, he was the prime minister before the current uh, prime minister. And he was able to sell the idea of uh, changing the interpretation of collective self-defense uh, from a Japanese perspective, which really just means Japan will do the commonsensical things required to defend itself and also to provide support to the Americans. And the public at large just thought, yeah, what's the big deal? And yet you had a very small number of uh, protesters um, outside of the, the diet. And that's what the foreign press focused on. I forget what the maximum figure was at any time, it was maybe 10,000. But when you consider that probably 70 million people live within maybe an hour or two's train ride of Tokyo, 10,000 people isn't very many. If you put that many into uh, say old DC stadium where those losers, the senators used to play and I used to watch them, 10,000 people would have been a huge crowd but DC stadium would also have looked empty. So that's, and most of those people were old. There were very few young people there. So it was really these remnants of the anti-war movement or even some who uh, had some direct memory of World War II and I don't blame them for not wanting to repeat any part of that. Um, but the point is that the Japanese public just shrugged and said, yeah, you know, you, you take um, public opinion polls in Japan, ask questions, do you have a good feeling about China? And the answer is like, 
90% no. Uh, and the Japanese public still, they watch the news and they read newspapers and they are very thoughtful about these things. So when you have Japanese officials talking about Taiwan and the requirement, the dangers and the risks, I think many people do understand that and would support a more uh, effective sort of approach towards military and things and national defense. But it's on the capital, it's on their Nagata Cho, their Capitol Hill, that it's the people are late getting to it. And part of that is decades of very effective Chinese political warfare or subversion, where they have bought off an awful lot of influence in Japan's political class, just as they have in ours and in just about every other major city or major country uh, around the world. So the, the, the pump's been primed. And if Japan gets that encouragement uh, to do what it needs to do, I think they could actually surprise us. But it does take the Americans to tell them what, what not just what we want, but what we must have. Uh, we've gotten ourselves into a position where by ourselves, I um, our prospects against the Chinese are uh, not, you know, it's not as if we are doomed to lose, but in uh, but it would be a lot harder than it needs to be now. And we need that help. But also there's a political significance of the, the leading democracies in Asia and elsewhere aligning together, developing a real capability to uh, conduct uh, military operations together, and which manifests itself in a political tightness that makes it very hard for the Chinese to, to split that the way they try to do using particularly their very effective political warfare. Uh, operations. So there's both an operational importance to Japan getting things right, but there's also a political significance and a psychological significance, which doesn't always get the attention it deserves. But the Chinese do notice it. They like to take on their victims one at a time, uh, and they don't like seeing a united front against them. So that's a part of what is at play uh, in the US-Japan relationship, but also the Taiwan uh, relationship as well. Well, I've, uh, China certainly reacted very strongly to the statements by Japanese officials. One almost is attempted to say hysterically. Uh, they have to be concerned over a more serious quad that is India, Australia, the United States, Japan. Uh, and their approach to China, as well as the new arrangement between the UK, Australia, and the United States regarding uh, nuclear submarine technology and other technology for Australia, even though that would be a long time coming. Do you think, do you, do you take these things as a serious expression of political will by those who are threatened by China? Mm -hmm. uh, I do, uh, especially if you've, and you remember this as well as I would, you know, just look back not all that long, where you could not even say China was an adversary. Uh, you know, I'll give, give you one example is that uh, in 2013, I was with uh, the Japanese who sent their first amphibious force over to, uh, their first amphibious force period, but they sent it over to California uh, for a, an exercise. It was the first amphibious exercise they'd really ever done much less done with the Americans. And this was down in Camp Pendleton. And I was interviewed, I think it was by Associated Press. And, and I made a comment that, you know, if uh, recent history has taught us anything, it is when that the democracies get together to defend themselves, it has a stabilizing effect. And that's what I said, something very close to that. The US Marine Corps ruling class and its commissars and its courtier class went absolutely berserk. You know, this is the Marine Corps, supposedly the bloodthirsty guys looking for a fight and aiming to defend freedom. Uh, you know, I was a reservist, so I didn't care, but, but also I had other, there were other things to do and this was an unhelpful distraction plus to free people anywhere uh, to hear this, see this sort of reaction uh, from these fools. Uh, it, 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 it did not escape notice. And my mother's East European, so I inherited her full capability for resentment uh, so I've got plenty of it, but this, but it shows you how the the U.S. side and the, the military, the civilian world, you could not even say that 
China was an adversary. And this was reflected, you could tell stories like this forever. Uh, so it's really just in the last few years that people have kind of woken up. And you see this even in the United States, uh, but Japan as well, Australia. Uh, and the Australians, I think, woke up first. Uh, and they really realized that they had a problem. This was about 2016. And they went, had a problem with Chinese subversion. And they went about addressing it right away and did a very good job of it. Now, as for the Indians, um, you know, I've heard Indian generals, actually retired ones, um, sort of say, to, say, look, you know, we've been at war with China since 1962. And then they don't say it, but what is wrong with you Americans that you can't figure this out? Uh, so the Indians, they've always known, but they, though they do have a uh, sort of a slice of their political class that uh, sees things differently. Uh, but they, this is, if you look around, think back a few years, and this is a big change. Uh, it remains to be seen if we can keep the momentum going and also translate this into really some concrete capabilities. Uh, also, not just on the military front, but let's include, say, an economic Article 5. So when uh, China puts economic sanctions, say, on Australia or Taiwan or Japan, or India or anyone or on us, will the other countries step in to back them up? Uh, and that's just as important actually, I think, as the military uh, front. Uh, but it is potentially a very, it's a, it's a good thing if you, but you, you have to always, if you look back five years, it looked a whole lot better than it did. Uh, but there is, a, there is a long way to go, but nonetheless, the first step is realizing you've got a problem and then setting out to do something about it. So this recent agreement that you mentioned between uh, the, U the UK, Australia, and the Americans is, is a good thing to see. I think it is momentous, but it's now the thing is, what do we make of it? And can we even, uh, and it's also it's important to look at it as augmenting the quad, that, that semi-formal relationship between the Japanese, the Indians, the Australians and Americans. That is, it's based on security matters for now, but it's intended to have a political, uh, economic and a broader sort of uh, element of cooperation. Is this latest, the AUKUS, the three-way UK, Australia, US thing, is, is it augmenting the quad and vice versa rather than something that's done in isolation? It's important to link these together and to bring in the Japanese uh, for starters somehow. Obviously the nuclear angle isn't one that's going to go anywhere anytime soon, but there's other ways that the Japanese can contribute to this and bring them in. And once you start working with people on sort of matters that are not theoretical, but are directly relevant to their self-defense, uh, it tends to change the relationship. And that's what we need is a more, uh, a deeper, more equal relationship with the Japanese, in fact, is what I would say that, uh, that so much of today's relationship with the Japanese is the outcome of oh, 60, 70 years of what I would call pathological dependence by the, the Japanese on the Americans. This idea that, well, the, Jap the Americans will take care of it. You know, we don't have to do uh, what we need to do for defense because the Americans are there. Uh, some Japanese politicians, when they're drunk, these older guys will actually refer to the Americans as their attack dogs. The idea being, well, you give them a bone and some water and they'll take care of things. And that's not really what you want people saying, much less thinking or vice well, versa. The, the so, fiasco in Afghanistan may have helped disabuse them of that. I think so. They, well, I, for, we'll see how soon that's forgotten, but I'm not so sure. I think it has woken up some people that they, they need to do more uh, on this. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Japanese were brushing off their, dusting off their nuclear weapons plans uh, at the moment, and maybe a few others are giving it some thought as well. And, and you can't blame them. That, that business in Afghanistan, you know, we may see they, um, the US side, the administration in particular, you'll hear, well, it was just Afghanistan, it's not important, but we're really serious about the Indo-Pacific because that is important. Well, sometimes these little things have an outsized effect uh, and they send a message, they discredit you. There's a, as I said, there's a psychological aspect uh, to all of this. And if people think America is confused and uh, weak, it's just 
that's inwardly focused, that's fighting with itself. Well, it's not the America that it was 20 years ago. It's just seen differently. And it's not just our, our allies and friends who see it that way, but the enemies do as well. And they may think they've got an opening. Uh, the one thing that may hold them back, I suppose, is that they may think if they wait a little longer, we will destroy ourselves even more and just make things easier. But that's being a little cynical, uh, but it's not, I don't think it's entirely un, uh, unreasonable to think that. Well, what's interesting is uh, when I have asked China experts, why didn't uh, Xi Jinping just wait for another five years? Why didn't he keep his powder dry and continue churning out an extraordinary number, number of naval war vessels and uh, increasing his missile strength, all of which he's doing, but simply not uh, talk and behave so aggressively. And by that time, five, 10 years, it would be too late for the United States to do anything. And in every instance, the response I've gotten back is, oh, they already think it's too late. That indeed is why they're behaving this way. Um, that? Oh. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you would agree with that uh, uh, as an accurate assessment of the way the Chinese leadership thinks. I would uh, certainly give it some some credit. You know, it just might be you know, that that is possible. Uh, that I think after the financial collapse in two thousand eight or so, the Chinese saw the Americans as sort of inexorably on a downslope, and them as on an, being on an upslope. So there may be some of that that they I, you know that I think there could be part of that, uh, and you're right that if they had kept their so-called charm offensive going, if you remember the late two thousands, when it was everything was smiles and their ambassadors all around the world were smiling and were talking about how it's a peaceful rise, want to be friends, no ill intent towards anyone, etc. That was actually very effective. Uh, you could see it in Asia, where all over the place. There were people in every single country uh, in the elite classes saying, you, know, you Americans, you know, the, the, it's, you're the problem. It's not China. You know, why are you trying to tell these ghost stories to scare people? You used to hear that everywhere. And that is, it's important to remember that. And as you say, I, I always thought another five years and they'd have been, they would have had us in a position, I think, where nobody could have moved and could have responded to them. I think part of it may be, I think, a calculated assessment that the, the Americans are finished uh, as a, or just, you know, headed down. So, you know, the future is Chinese, but also I think there's an aspect of it that um, is about the same as when like a fat guy goes to the buffet table and he say he's completely full and he sees this new tray of eclairs that's delivered and he just can't help himself. He's got to have them all. Yeah, even because it's a new tray of eclairs, and he doesn't want anyone else to have him. He just couldn't help himself. And that's what I, I think that is part of the, the Chinese motivation. And it is something that is, if you do business with the Chinese, uh, that there is very much a, sort of a peasant mentality there where uh, you just can't help yourself. If you see something, uh, you got to have it and you tend to overreach. And that, I say, may be part of the dynamic. It sounds a little funny, but you know, I kind of consider myself like that guy at the buffet table. If I see a new tray of eclairs, I got to have them. And I'm not even Chinese. But it, it's, um, as I say, it is this peasant mentality that you will see on display manifest sometimes in this uh, expression, what you die, I live, uh, which is, you, you hear a lot. Um, and it's, so I think they, they made a mistake. It was the hubris, uh, what have you, that the ancient Greeks knew all about that made them to think, play their hand too soon. And I think that may have been, a, you know, I'm glad they did because uh, we'd be in a lot worse trouble than we are today. Uh, but it's, um, you know, it's, it's, always, it's often hard to say motivations. You know, what is it that how could we fail for 20 year thing with all that much money floating around? We probably had our own version of the, the fat man at the buffet uh, trying to, to get rich quick off of the Afghanistan deal and maybe not having much uh, interest in ending it in some quarters. But that, so it's with the, I think what you've described with the Chinese that's uh, 
I think there's it, it needs to be taken very seriously. They thought their their time had come. Uh, and you look at really, if you think back on the appeasement, the accommodation that was going on in the 2010s, that why would they think otherwise? You know, when a when a commander of Indo PACOM or then PACOM says that his biggest concern is climate change, no mention of the Chinese. Well, if you're looking at it from China's perspective, and you have the Americans falling over themselves to engage with you, you have their these flag officers and retired flag officers who just love these trips to visit China. Uh, why wouldn't you think that your time has come? and these people are not going to defend themselves. I think it may not get the attention it deserves because nobody likes to think that U.S. side screwed up the answer that you're hearing from uh, some of the experts. But as you say, thanks to their imprudence and their, their continuing wolf warrior uh, diplomacy, they've done something uh, for the United States that I haven't seen since the Reagan years in the Cold War, and that is a bipartisan understanding of who is the threat and that we have to take it seriously. And I would certainly think that today there is a bipartisan agreement regarding China and which may account for how little the foreign policy toward China has changed with the change of administration since, since President Trump and now we have President Biden. I'm encouraged by what you say that there seems to be I presume a bipartisan consensus in Japan. So, so would the bipartisan consensus in Japan extend to the point that if there is a new prime minister from another party, uh, they would still take the Chinese threat seriously? I think the Japanese public will, would, and I think there would be a good chunk of the political class that, that would. That would. Um, but uh, you never quite know if, if you would, especially if you were to get a new party uh, in place. But I think that if they were to go too far, that they would see some, uh, uh, some public backlash pretty quickly. Uh, I think if it is an LDP candidate, that's the ruling party. Uh, if, they, if they're one of those, I think four candidates gets in, uh, I think you'd probably see a fairly similar approach to Taiwan. I don't see any huge changes, although some candidates are better than others. Uh, a couple of them have um, closer ties than China with China than one would like. Uh, apparently, there's some business ties between one candidate's family and the Chinese, and that can that has manifested itself in the past uh, in going easy on China. That was uh, a few years back now, but for example, China was uh, or the Japanese were going to do a small sort of amphibious landing on one of the islands near Okinawa. And the Chinese went berserk and they launched uh, sort of these rent mobs that went after Japanese businesses in China. One of which was a, it's a like a store, department store, supermarket that is, was actually the family that owned, it's a Japanese one, but it's the family that owns it. Well, it was one of the deputy prime minister's family. And somebody called off that, that exercise basically on Friday afternoon, and it appears to have been uh, the deputy prime minister operating his family's business. So that's always an issue, just as it is in the United States. And while there is a degree of bipartisan support towards, uh, towards on China policy in the US, keep in mind that Wall Street and the business class have immense influence and immense influence in every administration, including the Trump administration. They are doing their best to ensure America does nothing that makes the Chinese unhappy. Uh, but you, so, it, but back to Japan, I think that the sort of the, the consensus has pretty much shifted uh, sort of towards a um, stronger stance towards China and in, in a general sense towards supporting Taiwan. But as with a lot of things Japanesey, that you do have to wait and see what the concrete outcomes. Uh, of this are, but there's also something in the Japanese psyche that I don't think they are capable of taking a sort of a submissive, submissive or a secondary role to China. Uh, the idea that they would say, "Okay, China, yeah, it's your, you're the, you're the top dogs," that would be very hard to to imagine uh, for Japan's 
uh, Japan in general, but even its elite class, I'm not sure that they could do that. So there's a point at which they, they've gotten pushed too far. And I think they're just about at that point. But at the same time, uh, do they have the ability to respond and defend themselves uh, by themselves? That's debatable, probably not. But with the Americans, their odds improve immensely and vice versa. It also works to our advantage also. Uh, but if it's an ally or friend you want, uh, you know, the Japanese for the last 75 years have been a much higher manifestation of human decency and good behavior uh, than, and consensual government, rule of law, human rights, et cetera, uh, than just about anyone, and certainly just about anyone in Northeast Asia. Uh, so, you know, we've, uh, you know, we're fortunate, I think, to have uh, friends uh, like the Japanese, but they've got to do more. We have to do more as well. And we also have to help them uh, more than we have. And I think we expect them to actually make a bigger contribution uh, to, the, to the alliance. Could we talk now about the Taiwanese uh, perspective and Taiwanese capabilities? Sure. Mm-hmm. their own defense. Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, that does, have, that does matter, you know, what the Taiwanese actually think. There's a lot of the debate, as you, know, as you notice, it's a lot of other people talking about Taiwan and what Taiwan can or cannot do, what they should or shouldn't do. Uh, but and, uh, the Taiwanese themselves actually get very, relatively little attention uh, in all of this debate. And you would see this, uh, you see it in, in Taiwan with these, these teams of Americans come through, uh, like ex-officials, academics, et cetera, and they all come through. And what they say is, you know, you've got to spend more in defense. Uh, you've got to have asymmetric capability and you've got to buy this, this, and this, and you shouldn't buy that, that, and that. And the poor Taiwanese just, you know, they must be the politest people on the planet as they sit there and smile and, and take it. And my guess is that as soon as the, the Yankees are gone, they, they must just be kicking, you know, just, I don't know, you know, swearing, you know, a storm. But at this, because they just, these people come in, tell them what they need to do, and then leave. And but, so when you think of Taiwan, the thing to remember is that for the last 40 years, Taiwan has been effectively isolated. Uh, and the Taiwan military has been. Just nobody will deal with it, except in some very, at the, at the edges, and that's all. But the Americans will not do joint training, joint exercises with the Taiwan military. Their, rela- their interactions are very limited. So this is like, if Taiwan has developed like a, it's like a Galapagos uh, situation, where for 40 years, Taiwan's military has not developed or improved the way that it needs to, because it has not been allowed to operate uh, with anyone else, you know, hardly, and not in any meaningful way. And as I said, the, the bottom line is, well, will the Americans do joint exercises with them? No. And that tells you everything, that the Americans are too, still too frightened of the Chinese uh, to actually defend uh, the you know, 24 million free Chinese people. Uh, and this is something that for all the talk about you know, having Taiwan's back, you know, of, um, being more supportive of, uh, than ever, the Americans still won't really interact with them, uh, with the Taiwanese. That's from a military perspective. Economically, it's better, of course, uh, but, they, uh, but politically, once again, the Americans have not defended Taiwan on the political front the way that they should. So, so time, when you think of Taiwan you, and the way it looks at its defense, you have to consider the effects of 40 years of isolation, of being beleaguered and, for a while, it didn't matter all that much because the Chinese military wasn't enough to be much of a threat. But now it certainly is. Uh, now the PRC writ large is, a, is an immensely powerful uh, country. And Taiwan is, to say the least, worried. And why wouldn't you be? Uh, the, uh, and there's, there's always something of fear that, well, maybe the Americans really aren't that serious. And and maybe they won't defend us. And you, it tends to, over time, to wear down a population. It can create a sense of fatalism that, well, there's nothing we can do. We don't have any friends. So why should we even try? Um, or, if I could just interrupt with one question, because I've heard 
that the uh, Taiwanese military, like the Japanese military, also is always falling short of its recruitment requirements. Uh, is that so? And if it is so, is it a reflection of what you just said, the, the discouragement we feel? It's partly that, but it's actually, if you compare the, the, the situation with the Japanese military and the Taiwanese military, it's very similar actually, because in both cases, the problems they have and the solutions are pretty much the same. And they start with personnel. And as you said, they, they switched to an all volunteer force uh, recently, a few years ago, and that has not been able to attract sufficient numbers of people. Uh, but once, if you look at the terms of service, uh, that it's not an attractive profession. You know, there's no GI bill. You know, housing is practically like you know, living in poverty. Uh, it's, you're not well treated. Uh, if you, you are not by our standards and even by Taiwanese standards, it is a life of deprivation. Uh, if you join the military, it's amazing just how good they are, how many people do join, uh, just how capable that what they have is. But they, in both cases, they, the, the country, both, each country doesn't spend what it needs to spend on defense. It doesn't focus on the need to get personal, personal buying pieces of hardware. That, that's part of the, the question. Also in Taiwan, Terry's, the reserve, fortunately, it's a shambles. Uh, but it could be fixed very quickly. And there are Taiwanese who understand what needs done and they are trying to do that. Uh, so the Taiwanese military faces the, the challenges of I'd say 40 years of isolation, feeling like you have no friends uh, and it hasn't been properly funded by the political class, which doesn't see that as a vote getter. You know, and that really is unforgivable, uh, but with some effort, it could, make itself into such a tough nut to crack that uh, Xi Jinping wouldn't want to, to try it. Uh, not to mention the, the knock-on effects worldwide that would pretty much stop all of China's foreign trade and et cetera, et cetera, uh, if they were to go after Taiwan. But the concern is the free nations will not provide Taiwan with enough support that it feels like it can defend itself or has some decent prospects and it just might at some point feel like it's had enough. It, it sort of reminds one of, um, say, the, nobody much will get this, but uh, Rhodesia in about 1978-79, when the, the public the population was just tired out. You know, and a few years earlier, they had sort of, you know, sort of considered a mark of pride that they were taking on the world, but it just wears you out. And you sort of feel that sometimes uh, when talking to the to Taiwanese. Uh, but I have never met anyone in Taiwan who wanted to be part of China. Uh, and that it just, it goes, it's just getting even less likely that you'll meet anyone uh, in that. So it's, it's going away from, you know, any possibility of uh, willingly uh, going back to the, the, going, they've never been part of the PRC, but willingly uh, submitting to the, the PRC. So there is a lot of talk, you know, in, in DC as well about, uh, you know, bolstering Taiwan and things have been done around the edges where you treat your ambassador like an equal, uh, you send some American officials to Taiwan. And these are things, it's, you know, you, you like to think that step by step uh, that things will improve and more will be done to the point that gradually, you know, we, we take the support for Taiwan as a given uh, and that you, you'd like to see it happen that way. But really one of the big things is uh, you've got to help that military break out of this, this Galapagos effect. And that will do more to, I think, bolster Taiwan's defense or lead to the steps necessary to do that than just about anything uh, that we could do. I'd say more than any particular piece of hardware. Uh, I think it would be the Americans, um, you know, say helping the, the Taiwanese actually get out and about. What would that look like? One possibility is a sort of a Central Pacific HADR, Humanitarian Assistance Disaster Relief Force, uh, you know, that combines the American, Americans with the Taiwanese and you set up a small headquarters or office in Taiwan where American officers work with the Taiwanese to do the plans the, for, and then go out and exercise for HADR and then respond to real world capabilities, uh, real world instances. And if you get the Americans uh, involved, the, the Japanese just might get involved because they tend to follow along there and see what the Americans are doing towards Taiwan and then 
sort of calibrating what they will do. Uh, but once you do that, it creates an, there's an operational benefit, but also once again, a psychological and a political uh, benefit. This is something that should have been done 10 years ago. And it was suggested and our ruling class wasn't interested. Uh, but if it, it's like going to the dentist, if you go when you just need a, a filling, it's a lot better than taking a shot of vodka every, every time it hurts and then waiting 10 years and going to the dentist when you've really got uh, some problems. But you, you, that would, uh, we do need to make that trip to the dentist, uh, to my way of thinking. In respect to Taiwan, it's interesting that China also shot itself in the foot through its behavior in Hong Kong, which I imagine removed a lot of political favor within Taiwan for a peaceful reunification and solidified the opposition to, to doing so. Uh, you mentioned, however, this factor of demoralization from isolation. We haven't talked about Chinese capabilities yet, but <clears throat> as you know, the enormous buildup of missile forces across the Straits of Taiwan on the Chinese shore, the harassment by Chinese air forces uh, probing into Taiwanese airspace, the huge increase in the capabilities of uh, the Chinese naval forces. China presumably would wish for capitulation to have the fruits of war without war and just get Taiwan for nothing. Oh, well, except for the military price of the military buildup. But um, uh, as you know, a number of American admirals before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee have said to expect war in Asia within five years. And I believe in every case it's related to Taiwan, about which China has said, move towards independence or jeopardize our claim to that as Chinese territory, and we will go to war. How do things stand in terms of their capabilities to do that now? I think they're pretty good. Uh, the debate, of course, is one of the one of the debates is can the Chinese get across the Taiwan Strait, and the, the consensus thinking or the majority seems to be that they don't have the capability yet. I disagree with that, <clears throat> and I think they could have uh, got across uh, the Taiwan Strait even maybe ten years ago. Uh, they. Um, I think they could probably get some tens of thousands ashore in, in a day uh, if they had a mind to do so. Uh, the fact they don't have an amphibious force exactly like the American one doesn't really matter. Uh, they use their civilian resources well. They have uh, a, a lot of amphibious ships that are older, uh, and, but they work perfectly fine. Uh, they've got barges, et cetera, et cetera, and they've been training for this uh, for 50 years. You know, so there's a tendency to underestimate uh, Chinese capabilities. So personally, I think they could you know, have a pretty good go at an amphibious assault if that's what they, what they wanted to do. And, and keep in mind that that would take place um, in the context of a lot of other things. You know, just a sort of a missile barrages. You would have uh, Chinese, the Chinese Navy out and about, Chinese Air Force all over the place. There'd be cyber attacks, electronic warfare. You have fifth columnists, of whom there are plenty in Taiwan, uh, causing trouble all over the place. Uh, you can move, you don't need, you can move people across by a helicopter uh, as well. You could uh, have a sort of what you call it, a um, coup de main, where you seize a couple of Taiwanese ports, say, use Taiwanese organized crime, which is very closely linked to the PRC. There's ways you could make this uh, really a multifaceted, multi-directional attack. And an amphibious assault is just one part of it. And I think they probably could slip that in, in the context of everything else uh, that is going on. But you know, th that said, you know, do keep in mind that once, if, if that is done, that China had better get used to, as I say, seeing all, it, to its, all its foreign trade end and that sort of money-making machine on which the Chinese Communist Party depends, seeing that stop other than what you can do with North Korea and Iran and uh, trade with the Pakistanis. Uh, but that's, uh, so they've, the knock-on effects would be immense, uh, but they may think it's worth it. You know, that's always a possibility. Additionally, while we talk about you know, what I just described, a pretty uh, big war, 
you know, sometimes some would say, well, just uh, declare a blockade will serve the purposes very well and tell the Americans to stand back or else. And if you get the right administration or the wrong administration in power, uh, that they just might say, well, you know, it's, you know, we can't, nothing we can do. Uh, you know, 24 million people versus one point, however many billion. Well, you know, we just, sorry, it's, too, it's unfortunate. And with eyes primly averted, we let these people be enslaved. Uh, you know, one always wondered what, was, what people were thinking in 1938 about Czechoslovakia. How was the, were the elite classes actually rationalizing? I see this delivering independent free people into slavery. Well, we're seeing that happen now and it's not all that far fetched. Uh, you can imagine all the arguments and you can see the American Chamber of Commerce, uh, the China, US business you know, organizations, et cetera, saying, look, it's just not, we don't wanna fight, cause too much trouble. Uh, you can see Wall Street, you know, which, you know, where they would vote. Uh, so you say you can see it wouldn't necessarily have to be a sort of a sort of a, an all out attack, but rather, you know, just this assault on the economic front could do very well. And Chinese political warfare in Taiwan is immense. Uh, they do have a lot of influence in the parts of the media. Uh, academia is, is really bad in terms of just outright quizlings. And it's nonstop. As I say, nonstop in the political class, you've got this influence as well. So while most Taiwanese don't want any part of mainland China, that Chinese political warfare is no less effective in Taiwan than it is in the United States, and maybe even more effective uh, given the, the ease of operation uh, that they have. The Chinese nearly pulled off a, sort of a, a presidential election you know, the time before last. Well, they even tried this last time, but they by really bringing their candidate out of nowhere uh, by success and, and using social media in particular to create sort of a, a groundswell of attention and support for him. And fortunately, this was detected at the last moment. And the, the Taiwan administration, the uh, Madam Tsai's administration did a pretty good job of cracking down on it. But the, the subversion in Taiwan is, is very serious, something to, uh, to worry about. So the uh, but, you know, so could China seize Taiwan? I think they may think, just might think they could uh, at the present time. Could they think they could go after it with some uh, lesser measures than that? I think they are trying. Uh, they would like to have Taiwan just roll over and just give up. Uh, but much depends on the cost benefit analysis and what they think the rest of the civilized world would do on Taiwan's behalf. Uh, one of the interesting dynamics of the whole equation, or one, uh, one of the parts of it is that in China, and this has been going on for a de few decades now, is that anybody who can tries to get their money out of China uh, and put it into a country that, is like, that isn't China, that has rule of law, property rights, et cetera. So they're trying to get their money into the US, into Australia, Canada, the UK. And they also want to get a... Um, a relative out with a green card. So you have your elite class and a lot of people outside that class, but particularly at the very top, uh, they're trying to hedge their bets and say, set up in the country they declare as their main enemies. And that's, a, it's like a futures market sort of where the people who are benefiting most from the system appear not to have all that uh, much confidence in the future. And that is something, so that's something that is, works to our advantage. I wish we would take, would, um, take advantage of it, uh, but I can't think of another historic example where this has been going on. You know, and if my, you know, if you want to test the thing, we we'll just have China uh, remove exchange controls for four, for th four weeks. And you would see everybody who can selling their Chinese currency and putting it into dollars yen euros it, they do this sucking sound that ross perot used to talk about but it would be 10 times louder uh, that everyone trying to get their money out of the prc and as i said these are the people who benefit the most from that system so that is it's, a, it's part of the dynamic uh, that I would, it needs to be uh, paid more attention to and capitalized on i think if we were were wiser you know, and i hope one day we will what, what are china's other vulnerabilities? Uh, the main one is that um, 
well, one, it's a, you know, it is a country where, uh, you know, they take live organs or organs from live prisoners. There's, there is no rule of law. Um, and I'm a lawyer, like two out of three Americans. So I would sort of recognize it if I see it. There's no property rights. Uh, they, there are regional differences as well, uh, where the, the Northerners don't like the Southerners and, and there's other splits as well. Uh, you have uh, corruption, despite Xi Jinping allegedly going after it, is still a huge problem uh, in China. But the one thing where I see is they, that we still have a sort of a handle on is the US dollar. And that is the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, which is another way of saying everybody wants the dollar. Uh, and China's currency uh, is not convertible. And what that means is that for everything China wants to do overseas, so if you want to buy technology, you want to buy companies, if you want to buy iron ore, uh, or you want to fund the Belt and Road, you have to pay in dollars. And if you don't have dollars, you can't do all those things, or you have to make some very hard choices. And unfortunately, America's financial class and business classes have probably been pumping in two or $300 billion a year into China every year. And then there's the Europeans as well and the Japanese. So we've effectively been funding uh, the China's uh, foreign currency needs. But otherwise, if, if your currency is not convertible or freely convertible, you've effectively got the same problem that Jefferson Davis had in the old Confederate States of America. If you want to buy Enfield rifles from the British, you've got to pay in Yankee greenbacks. And if you don't have them, if you don't have that money, you can't buy those things. And that hurts your defense. Uh, it's, it's really it's a similar problem to Zimbabwe, just on a much bigger scale. Uh, without those dollars, you aren't quite as uh, mighty a country as you think you are. And, and that's why you, know, you see everybody who can in China trying to put their money into dollars. But that's the big advantage we have, is the threat to them saying, OK, you know, here's your choice. You know, if you want to terrify Taiwan and our Japanese friends, go ahead. But you're going to have to do it with somebody else's money. And you cut off, you uh, sort of de-link China from the, the US dollar system. Um, that would, of course, give vapors to any number of uh, commentators and Wall Street, et cetera, uh, and the, the financial class. But at some point, you know, the, a country is such a threat that you've got to play that card. But that, I think, is their biggest vulnerability is financial economic uh, as well. And if your country, if you're Currency is not convertible. Um, it also suggests a certain sort of lack of confidence in the country, in the system. And ultimately, you know, the, the PRC, it, it really is run like an organized crime gang. Uh, you know, that's you know, just as a really big one. Uh, and so much of the, the dynamic, the way that it, it operates are, is, is what that is. And those sorts of regimes, they seem pretty powerful. Uh, sometimes, but they also have a certain fragility or brittleness uh, that uh, that at some point it, it will play itself out. Uh, so that's you know just a couple of things that uh, the uh, that I would point to as, as vulnerabilities, but particularly on the financial front. And if you're going to fund your biggest adversary, and and they will tell you, Chinese will tell you that America is their enemy. If you're going to fund them, it's hard to. Uh, think of why we should expect to prevail. Um, it is about that simple. If you, you know, think of the Germany in the 1930s, uh, it's not all that different. Um, so this is, we have, a, we have four aces to play if we would play them, but we seem to like to give two of them over to the Chinese. Yeah, how do the Chinese themselves view their own vulnerabilities aside from these financial matters? Some of which Xi seems to be indifferent to when a trillion dollars disappears in uh, stock market values uh, due directly to his actions. Uh, he, he appears more interested in asserting control mm -hmm. than he does in th those co Chinese companies doing well. Uh, but they, when they look out, uh, they have energy needs. They're not an autarky. Uh, a lot of what they need goes through the Straits of Malacca and, and through the Straits of Taiwan and down by the Philippines. Um, they 
certainly there, aside from the fact that they're an anti-status quo power and, and the fact that they are fired by a sense of grievance, they're always expressing a grievance from their century of humiliation, um, there's a certain strategic sense to their naval buildup to protect the necessary energy supplies they need to get, plus their own interest in, in reliance on trade. You know, I always, you know, often find that it's useful to actually step back and admire what the Chinese have accomplished. Uh, they have sized up their situation. They've sized up their opponents. They've, they look at the whole map and they figured out what they need to do to support themselves. And they I say, you've got to hand it to them. And there's a uh, sort of an industriousness to the Chinese that has always been there. In fact, the I think the apparent success, such as it is, of the P, of the CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, is that they, about what thirty years ago, they actually stopped killing and starving their citizens, and let Chinese industriousness kick in, and that's what will get you some prosperity. And you will notice that there used to be something called uh, the Yankee Trader. Now you could go to any part of the world; there'd be some American selling something. That species is, I think, mostly extinct, uh, unless there's a five-star hotel in wherever it is, but you will find Chinese everywhere. And that is the same industriousness that built the left half, the hard half of the American transcontinental railway. Uh, so you have to admire what the Chinese had done and you underestimate them at your peril. Uh, but there is a rapaciousness to all of this, which uh, over time it wears on the recipients of it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they have looked at the whole map, they've looked at outer space, they've looked at below the oceans, and they've set about uh, sort of, uh, for what do you call it, um, furthering their interests up there. And they are just as smart as we are. Uh, they have just as able, maybe even a little better at uh, thinking out a long-term plan and then trying to uh, carry it out. Uh, so this is, you know, once again, as you pointed out, it's not... Uh, you know, the, the Chinese do have their own ideas of ways, what they want the world to look like and their position in it. And they've set out to, uh, to make it happen. Uh, we have tended to, us, uh, to assume that, well, they're, they're just like Canadians and they don't mean anybody ill, but they, well, the old Canadians at least, but they, um, but they, you know, they, they're not. And they, they say, you, you gotta hand it to them in some respects. Um, but unfortunately, the, the, given the nature of that regime, it is one that we should stay as far away from as we possibly can and do everything we can to uh, defend ourselves. In some respects, it's the modern day version of the Mongols showing up on the eastern, you know, the, the east, you know, three days ride from Krakow. Uh, you know, this is the kind of threat that we face and, and they are, but so I don't want to, I'm not in any respect underestimating or belittling uh, the Chinese uh, at all, but the uh, used to hear this a lot actually with the Marines, since that's something I know, is that when you would suggest that they could have an amphibious force like ours, you would be told, you'd see the eyes roll as if, oh, they will never be as good as us. Um, well, got that wrong. Um, so it's, uh, you know, this is a formidable foe, and, and I'm not sure exactly how it will play out. I'd like to think that, you know, it, um, that, that God gives the U.S. more chances than it deserves, and maybe this one too will uh, will figure out a, a, a way to uh, to get a, get out of it all. But also, one thing about the Chinese psychology, is, and I you know hesitate to sort of analyze the entire population, but like people anywhere, uh, they do. You will find a widespread sort of love of the country, uh, such as it's perceived, and a also a sort of a, a willingness uh, to do greater or lesser degrees to defend it and to take offense when you think that you've been wrong. And she is smart enough. He's trying to stoke all this sort of thinking and you know who wouldn't in his position. Uh, and that is a dangerous thing when people are, are out for blood. I mean, you, goodness, you saw the, the Argentinians when they went after the Falklands. Uh, you know, for a few weeks, they were all jazzed up about, you know, sticking it to the British. And then that had a way of, the, the outcome was not happy and it caused the thinking to shift pretty quickly, but it, China is not the first regime to, uh, to, to play to sort of mass psychology. 
uh, and to as part of their sort of this comprehensive national power, that expression that they will use. And when country and people in it think that they're on a roll, that they've got the momentum, uh, that can be a dangerous thing uh, to my way of, of thinking. Well, let me uh, close with a, a touchy issue. Uh, you mentioned earlier that perhaps at some point Japan would dust off its uh, nuclear weapons plant. It was some years ago that a Chinese general said something like this regarding the United States, uh, you won't trade Los Angeles for Taipei or something like that. In other words, the nuclear exchange would be so devastating for you, you're not going to do it for this little island. Well, uh, the deterrent situation would change considerably if indeed Japan and even Taiwan had a nuclear weapon or weapons, and China had to take that into calculation. What do you think about that? Well, I, th I think it will, it would. You know, if you consider North Korea, that the only reason anybody pays it any attention is because it has nuclear weapons and has a lot of artillery within range of Seoul. Uh, but it's those nukes and the nuclear weapons and the ability to launch them uh, so they go quite a ways away and potentially hit us. Uh, that, that's why North Korea gets so much attention. Uh, I would say that there's a, maybe a similar sort of thing that would be at play should Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, or even Australia uh, get nuclear weapons, as you know, un unimaginable as some people will say it is uh, at the present time. Uh, but it, you know, it changes the dynamic when you can cause that much damage with, with one shot. Uh, and that at the same time, nothing's ever as simple as it seems that, you know, because one could imagine circumstances where, you know, China might say, okay, fire away. You know, we've got for every one you send, we will send 10. Uh, and so it's not quite the ace in the hole that it sometimes seems, depending on the kind of regime or, or country you're dealing with, just you know, depending on circumstances. Uh, that it, so it's, uh, you know, it opens up uh, just a, a lot of other scenarios, potential problems uh, as well. Uh, sort of like when you sort of change a figure on an Excel spreadsheet, uh, that it seems, you know, you get these changes all over the place that you, you didn't think about. And so it's, it is something that, you know, once you take that step, you never quite know where it's going to end. But the, sometimes it could seem to be the sort of the, 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 the least best or the, the least bad of the choices that you've got. And if you can't depend on anyone else, well, might as well give this a try. But it, it is uh, shows just how things have changed over the last 10, 20 years and kind of what a, uh, a dilemma that we've gotten ourselves into. Well, great. I'm afraid we're out of time. And I'd like to thank Grant Newsom for discussing with us today how the threat from China is perceived by Japan and Taiwan and other issues. I would invite uh, our viewers to go to the Westminster Institute webpage or Google us, and you will find a library of such videos um, addressing China, Russia, the Middle East, Afghanistan, and other issues. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Riley.